So as the field matures, one of the things that is a constant drumbeat is that how do we explain impact? How do we get rig really rigorous about measuring it, managing it? You can only manage what you can measure. You've all heard these things, and I'm sure you're trying to figure out how you do that within your own organization. One of the things that's really challenging about this is that there are so many different efforts that finding one way that we can have these conversations across so many sectors and industries and issue areas feels like a daunting task. There's amazing organizations that have done a lot of collaborative, collaborative efforts over the years to move us forward on these conversations. Some of the leaders in this conversation are here with us today with some of the new infrastructure that's really building on what's come before and trying to knit these efforts together to help us do better in managing, measuring, talking about, being clear about impact. Please welcome Brian Trellstad, Andrew Lee, Lauren Booker-Allen, and Michael Merculis. So we may know whether we're making money with our impact investments, but how do we know whether we're making a difference? Over the next 20 minutes, we will talk through how the Impact Management Project has developed a shared convention around understanding the impact that we're having at the interface between an enterprise and a project and the people and planet we seek to benefit. I'm Brian Trellstad, a partner at Bridges Fund Management. I'm joined by Andrew Lee from UBS, Lauren Booker-Allen from the Umidyar Network, and Mike McCrellis from Root Capital. We've long talked about impact measurement in the field of impact investing but we really haven't understood it in the context of impact management. The Impact Management Project, a project facilitated by Bridges Impact Plus, our advisory arm, and supported by the Ford Foundation, Omidyar, DFID, and a handful of asset managers like UBS and BlackRock, and leading practitioners in the field like Root Capital, Acumen Fund, and LeapFrog, has tried to ask a question of how do we understand the information we need to measure the impact that happens at a company or a project and how does that match with the investors' goals that they outlined when they made the original investment? We've been lacking a construct for thinking about this. Perhaps a metaphor might help. If an individual investor, say me, goes to a wealth advisor, say Andrew, and says, how do I invest my generous SOCAP speaker's fee, whether that's in the halls of UPS's, the UBS private bank or on the phone with Fidelity, that advisor is always going to ask me, what are my return expectations? What's my risk tolerance? What's my liquidity need? What's the time frame? How else am I invested? Before they can make a sensible recommendation. Impact investments have not had a similar construct for thinking about the impact. Where we hope we've arrived after consultation with 700 people over the last year, many of you in the room, is a shared understanding that impact happens at the interface between enterprise and the people and planet we seek to benefit. Impact can be both positive and negative. It can be intended and unintended. And what we need is a shared understanding of how impact is measured at that enterprise level and how that can move up the value chain to the investors who've made the original allocation. Impact has five fundamental dimensions. What impact are we seeking? For whom? How much of that impact do we want to have? What contribution? is the enterprise making that otherwise would not have happened? And what risk is there that the impact that we're seeking to have is not going to happen? What we'd like to do is talk through how this understanding can translate into creating portfolios of impact investments, whether it's asset managers or whether it's nonprofit uh, impact investors like Root Capital. So Lauren, let me start with you. The Amidiar Network has been a phenomenal impact investor and contributor to the development of the field. Why did you support this work and what are your hopes for the continued development of impact management? Thanks, Brian. So like many of you in this room, Amidiar Network has been incredibly inspired and enthused by the incredible evolution of the impact investing sector over the past 10 years. I think we, like everyone, have been trying to embrace this big tent notion that was effectively baked into the DNA of this space very intentionally at the beginning to ensure that we had some type of a common umbrella to ensure that everyone from pension funds to CDFIs, high net worth individuals and investors in between, let alone all of the entrepreneurs that were excited about this opportunity, could all have some sort of tent to live under. 
that was intentional because we wanted to make sure that there was more capital allocated to the space and then we could start to figure out what a, a field uh, could look like if it turned into a movement and a marketplace. But over the past few years, the Video Art Network and several others have gotten uh, increasingly skeptical and concerned about the big tent nature uh, and some of the potential risks that we could see, um, namely because of the influx of all of the new investors coming in. And so some of the risks that we thought were hugely important were the potential uh, misalignment between financial expectations and impact expectations for various different investors. The, mm -hmm. ongoing, ideolog uh, the ongoing ideological debate about return trade-offs, the, conf the confusion around capital allocation, the really opaque marketplace, and the super high transaction costs that are associated with this impact matching, if you will, um, and the potential for a lot of capital to be left on the sidelines if this wasn't done right. So we started to try to have a conversation around this critical need for market segmentation because, well, we all know that financial risk and return are fundamentals that have effectively had deep roots in traditional finance, we had not actually thought about the core categorization of impact, which is effectively what's differentiating this entire industry. So we started to see it a few different efforts. Uh, some of you might have recalled the Tideline piece on navigating impact investing, and most recently have been big backers of the Bridges Project. And I think why we're super excited about these 700 folks that have already been part of this journey for developing you know, effectively what would be a set of shared fundamentals to help create a better characterization of what impact could mean alongside financial risk and return so that we can have that more nuanced way of thinking about the impact risk and return equation. So we think that, and our call to action for everyone in this audience is engage with it. It's not done yet. We wanna make sure that as we're moving into adoption and we're thinking about how it should be iterated, how we can make it more effective for investors and everyone across that value chain, we need to make sure that there's constant feedback, but we also know that the promise is, if we can figure out how to all adopt this in a mainstream manner, we can effectively crack open the opportunity for a more efficient marketplace with more capital flowing. Great, thanks. And Andrew, uh, at UBS, you've used the convention to demonstrate how a traditionally managed portfolio can migrate towards a portfolio of sustainable and impact investments. Can you tell us first why UBS is doing this, and second, what were some of the insights from that experience? Sure, thanks, Brian. Um, Look, I think it's driven by two things. We have client demand, which is definitely there, and it's not just from the expected groups that you might think of, millennials, next-gen, entrepreneurs. Um, it's really from a broad-based set of our clients. Um, it's people who have been with us for 40 years. Um, and that's what's really exciting to see the people who haven't necessarily traditionally engaged with the concept of incorporating impact into investment portfolios are really engaging. We have a significant number of client conversations that involve some sort of discussion on how can we involve a sustainable angle or an impact angle? I mean, I think it derives really from people's realization, you know, what all of you in this room know, um, that in our investments, all of the ones that we make have effects on people and planet, both positive and negative. And there's an increasing realization that we need to, as an investors, take that into account. Now, I sit in the chief investment office, and you know, we have a rigorous approach to financial risk and return. We look at volatility, liquidity, um, and all of your other traditional concerns. We develop capital markets assumptions for our traditional asset classes, um, all of which goes into our existing investment process. Now, when thinking about how to incorporate impact into that investment process in an effective way, um, there is no construct that has existed um, for us to be able to do that. And so, the Impact Management Project framework um, was incredibly helpful for us, uh, both from the start of the process to the finish of the process as we started to develop these portfolios, taking us from our traditional construct of no impact considerations through to something that's a little bit more aspirational, um, where 100% you know, of the exposures or the building blocks in those portfolios incorporate some form of impact consideration. Um, and having that or what are steps towards a more rigorous framework that matches up against our approach with, uh, on the financial risk and return side is incredibly important um, to us. And so whether it's the intentions that we talk about or the five dimensions that you described, Brian, all the way to the investor contribution, making sure that we set out from the beginning what are investors really looking for or what are our clients really looking for and taking that all the way through the process to how do we change the building blocks from traditional asset classes or investments through to ones that have uh, that, that think about or consider impact, um, all the way through to the solution and the implementation side, and then, as Lauren mentioned, iteratively back to make sure that at the end of the journey, we've achieved what we set out to do. 
that framework is incredibly important to us. Great. And, and Mike, at the other end of the, the spectrum of capital and from a fund manager, a nonprofit fund manager that lends directly to businesses that uh, assist smallholder farmers, you looked across a portfolio of about 600 transactions and a billion dollars. Uh, what did you guys learn in coming up with the efficient impact frontier? And what are some of the lessons from this project for you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So the efficient impact financial frontier, it's a kind of a technical term, but it's very simple. It just means a portfolio that offers the most of the particular type of impact that you care about relative to the risk and return that you're taking. It's based on the concept of the efficient frontier from mainstream finance. So in mainstream finance, a portfolio in the efficient frontier offers the most return for the risk. And what we're doing is extending that two-dimensional framework to include these new dimensions of impact. The reason it matters is that if you've been involved in impact investing for any amount of time, you're familiar with these debates about trade-offs between impact and return and mainstreaming and market rate versus non-market rate and so forth. And those are not really the best questions to be asking. What the concept of the efficient impact financial frontier does is it gives us a much better question, a more productive and actionable question to ask, which is, does this portfolio in front of me offer the most of the specific type of impact I care about relative to the risk and return that I'm taking? Or could I get the same impact with better financial performance elsewhere or vice versa? So it sounds simple. Why aren't more folks doing this? <laughs> no, it, it, the fact is people have been talking about this for a long time. It's not a new idea. Leaders in this room have been talking about this, so we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I think that impact management is a barrier. I think that the second barrier, which is underappreciated, is getting impact management out of its silo and integrated into financial management so that it can be useful. And I think the message of this work for the community is it's possible. You can do this. It's not just aspirational. Um, and it's been a transformative experience for Root Capital, both in terms of how we select investments and in getting us past our internal debate about impact versus financial sustainability, and in communicating with our donors and investors about the role that their capital is playing in unlocking impact. Great. And Lauren, I know the Amidiar Network has been working with a number of the Giving Pledge families. Curious how you think that this construct the impact management approach will be helpful to bring them into impact investing. Yeah, so uh, at Amidiar Network, we've actually supported about 150 families around the world with their impact investing journeys. And, you know, like everyone in this room, families have various different motivations that effectively bring them to the space of impact investing. Very different motivations, very different expectations. Some are there because they really want to figure out how they can better align their portfolios with their, ask, with their values. Some are thinking, how can I actually leverage this to catalyze more impact um, and you know, think about this from a philanthropic perspective. Some think that it's a tool for multi-generational wealth stewardship. And some genuinely believe in the, um, much of the data that's coming around on lo about long-term outperformance as it relates to impact opportunities. So we see these tools as effectively really important educational and empowerment tools, uh, namely because I think everyone knows in this room that even though we've seen an influx of investors, families have truly been at the frontier of pushing this movement forward. And this has been very often in the absence of data and strong and rigorous frameworks. And so having you know, the TIMP framework and efficient uh, portfolio impact opportunities for them to actually articulate what it is that they want to see what's possible, as Mike said, um, is going to be really important because they can take that to their advisors. And guess what, advisors? This is an opportunity for you as well, namely because I think we all know that very often advisors tend to be the bottleneck that prevent a lot of families from being able to really actively engage in the space. So I also encourage advisors to look at this as a really, a really interesting opportunity to be impact enablers, if you will. Right. You point it to advisors as potentially a weak link in the chain, but Mike, as you think about the chain from the smallholder that borrows from the company that you invest in to root through to the investors in root, uh, back up to the clients that may be uh, part, of, part, part of UBS's private bank, where's the weakest link on that chain from your perspective? I think that there's weaknesses at each point. I think that you can use increasingly big data that's more available to identify areas of poverty and environmental degradation. Um, I think learning about which businesses are having an impact is harder. Um, I think that each, each participant in the value chain has to be transparent about what value they're adding along the way, what is their contribution. 
But ultimately, I think it is the asset owners and the providers of concessionary capital in particular who will have to drive change in increasing transparency. I think they have such an important role to play in being the moral heart of this market and demanding impact management and in providing the, the support for organizations that are those first adopters of these new practices. Andrew, do you see similar bottlenecks, or what's your perspective? I would actually frame it differently. I think I see the, the, the weakest link in the investment value chain is the fact that we have an investment value chain in the first place. You know, in an ideal state, we'd have us as allocators or end investors investing directly into the enterprise where the benefit is happening. But the reality is that we have limitations on our knowledge, you know, knowledge, our skills, our understanding of impact, our geographic understanding. And so we have to have skilled specialists in an intermediary, and therefore we have an investment value chain. And that, I think, is actually what makes impact management so hard, is that we set intentions, we set objectives, and making sure that those translate all the way through and then iterate back is a really tough thing. So I think we can mitigate it through the use of, um, you know, guidelines, through the use of uh, uh, philosophy, uh, philosophical alignment, and really you know, frameworks like the Impact Management Project, frankly, to get us all on the same page so we're talking about the same language, right? So when I talk to a fund manager, and that fund manager is trying to explain how he's fulfilling or she is fulfilling the objectives that we're trying to achieve, you know, something inevitably gets lost in translation along that value chain. So, I think the frameworks that help us establish conventions and common language are really helpful to getting us to a better place. We're not, it's not going to be perfect, right. but it gets us to a better place. And we were just at the WEF meeting in NYC where another TLA was on everyone's lips, this, the SDGs, um, TLA, three-letter acronym, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. What does the uh, uh, sort of promotion of the Sustainable Development Goals mean for the impact investing community and for you as an asset manager? Um, you know, so for us, I think the SDGs are a helpful framework um, for guiding uh, some of the outcomes. Um, they're, you know, self-identified, or they're identified by the field, they're, they're, they're predefined, um, and they can provide us with a guide to at least the what portion of those questions, the what of the five dimensions. I do worry a little bit about the SDGs using, being used more as a marketing tool than as an investment guide to what we should be focusing on. Um, we've personally you know, adopted the SDGs as being helpful. We've identified six that are particularly helpful for private wealth to focus on. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I see it as a helpful framework um, in conjunction with establishing the what of the impact management project. Great. We're sort of nearing the end of our time, and I want to ask each of you uh, the question of, we'll know the practice of impact management is widespread when, dot, dot, dot. Uh, so maybe I'll start with you and uh, Mike and work down the line. Sure. So for me, I think the practice of impact management is widespread when many or most investors have integrated impact management into financial management. And it sounds technical, I realize, but I mean, I think I and most of us got into this business for <coughs> social justice and equality of opportunity. And the opportunity that we have here is to embed those values into the formulas of financial markets because we can embed those, those objectives into the formulas that determine what investments and loans we do. We can move to a new form of capitalism that serves everybody without losing the rigor that's sort of associated with the previous version of financial markets. And I think that's the opportunity that we have, that we have here. Yeah, I think there's two things. So first, a greater market segmentation and clarity around risk, return, and impact. I, I don't want to belabor that point, but I would love to see that across impact opportunities, across asset classes, throughout the investment value chain. I think very often, you know, we're still hearing, well, this is a language challenge. That was the same thing we heard 10 years ago, and I imagine it's gonna be the same thing we hear for the next few years, but I think Temp has the possibility of really helping us move beyond that so that we're all speaking, as Clara Barbie often talks about this golden thread, so that we can effectively, and the second point of this is just have a much more efficient uh, marketplace where capital that was previously sitting on the sideline is really excited to engage in impact. For me, I think it's when my team and I are out of jobs uh, because it'll mean <laughs> that, frankly, yeah. impact management and the philosophy of impact management will have been fully incorporated into, you know, throughout this investment value chain from the people internally who work with us on product development, our distribution people, our external fund partners, um, everyone will have incorporated it and therefore there won't be any need for us. It will be fully integrated into our approach to an investment process and how all of our partners enable the solutions for us. That's great. 
Well, we want to invite all of you who have not yet participated in the Impact Management Project. It has been a collaborative effort of the field to define what the practice is. We are continuing with the support of Ford, Omidyar, Diffid, and others to drive from a conceptual understanding into practical application so that CIOs can build portfolios, so that fund managers can report in efficient ways, and so enterprises have the tools to understand the impacts that they're having, both positive and negative, intended and unintended, on the people and planet we seek to help. But thank you for your time, and thank each of you for your participation. Thank you. Thanks, <clears throat>